This video gives an introduction to the cross product of two vectors. The cross product is defined for vectors in three dimensions. If we're given two vectors in terms of their components, then we can define the cross product as the determinant of the following expression. We put the vectors i, j, and k at the top, and then we put the components of vector a and the components of vector b in that order. Then we compute the determinant as we would with any matrix. One way of doing this is by expanding along the top row. By that, I mean we take the first entry here, i, and we multiply it by the determinant of the submatrix a2, a3, b2, b3, that we would get by crossing out the row and column that i is in. Then we subtract the vector j times the submatrix, the term of the submatrix a1, a3, b1, b3, that we would get by crossing off the row and column that j is in. Finally, we add the vector k times the determinant of the submatrix a1, a2, b1, b2, that we would get by crossing off the row and column that k is in. Notice that the positive and negative signs alternate, plus i, minus j, plus k. Now we evaluate these little two by two submatrix determinants by just multiplying down the diagonal from the top left to the bottom right, and then subtracting the other diagonal. In other words, we get i times a2, b3, minus b2, a3, minus j, times a1, b3, minus b1, a3, plus k, times a1, b2, minus b1, a2. If we don't like the negative j here, we can factor it through and rewrite our cross product as follows. I'll rewrite it one more time using component notation and cleaning it up to make the a's always before the b's in each of these products. So this fairly complicated formula is the formula for the cross product of A cross B, but as we'll see, it's worth the trouble because the cross product has some very nice features. First, let's get a little more familiarity with the cross product by computing an example with numbers. So if I want to find A cross B for these two vectors, I'm going to take the determinant of I, J, K, and I'll just fill in the components of my vectors here, and now I'll expand out along the top row, and I get i times the determinant of 2, 3, negative 1, 10, because that's what I get when I cross out the row and column for i. It just leaves that submatrix. And now I do minus j times the submatrix I get by crossing out that column and that row. So that's 1, 3, 5, 10, and then plus k times the term of the submatrix I get by crossing out that row and that column. So that's 1, 2, 5, negative 1. And now I'll compute the determinants of the submatrices. So this is 2 times 10 is 20 minus negative 3. So that's, I'll just write 20 minus negative 3 minus j. Here I have 10 minus 15, and I have plus k times negative 1 minus 10, and that simplifies to i times 23, or 23i, 23 uh, plus 5j minus 11k. So my cross product vector is given by that answer. So the great thing about cross products is that the cross product of a and b is perpendicular to both a and b. That's really where that complicated formula comes from is finding a formula that will, will have this property. So let's just verify that. If we take A cross B and dot it with A, using the formula from the first page, that's this expression. Where as usual, A1, A2, A3 are the components of A, and B1, B2, B3 are the components of B. Now multiplying out, I get this, and distributing, I get this, 
And now the fun begins. Let's see here. I have A2, B3, A1 over here. And that's the same thing as, I found it, A2, B3, A1 here. So those two cancel. And now we also have an A1, B2, A3 here. And an A1, B2, A3 here that cancel. And finally, we have this term here cancels with this term here. So everything cancels out and we have a nice number of zero as the dot product. You can check that similarly, if you work out the algebra, A cross B dotted with B is also gonna give you zero. Now anytime the dot product of two vectors is zero, that means the two vectors are perpendicular because the cosine between them has to be zero. So that proves that A cross B is perpendicular to A and A cross B is perpendicular to B. Now, there are actually two different vectors that are perpendicular to A and B, right? Because you could have, once you have one vector perpendicular to them, you could always go in the opposite direction. So it turns out that the direction of A cross B is given by the right-hand rule. So if this is the vector A and that's the vector B, and we take the cross product, what we do is we stick our, the palm of our hand at the origin, stick our fingers out towards A, rotate them towards B, and then the direction our thumb points, in this case would be sort of up, I guess, um, would be the direction of A cross B. So in this example, A cross B would be coming out of the page instead of going into the page. Now you might, might remember that with dot products we had sort of an algebraic definition of dot product in terms of components and we had a more geometric definition in terms of magnitudes and the cosine of an angle. Well, the same thing is true for cross products. We've seen the algebraic definition, but we also have this, this fact, this geometric fact that if the angle between A and B is given by theta, so here's A and Here's B, and that's the angle theta. And we want to make sure we choose theta between 0 and pi. So we're going to use theta to be the smaller angle rather than the bigger angle. Okay, so if we do that, then it turns out that the magnitude of the vector A cross B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of theta. Notice that since theta is between 0 and pi, the sine of theta will be a positive number, so this is, this is plausible. The proof involves a lot of algebra that I'll step through quickly. Let's start by looking at the norm of A cross B squared. Using the formula for A cross B from the first page, the first component of A cross B is A2, B3, minus A3, B2, so we'll square that plus the square of the second component of the cross product, plus the square of the third component of the cross product. If I multiply all that out, I get the following expression. You can check that that actually can be rewritten as the following expression. To check that, just multiply these out and cancel terms. Now this is the same thing as the norm of A squared times the norm of B squared minus the dot product a dot b squared. But we can rewrite the dot product as the norm of a times the norm of b times cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. Now I can factor out a norm of a squared and a norm of b squared from this term, and also from this term since these are actually squared, and use the trig identity to rewrite 1 minus cosine squared theta as sine squared theta. Now the equation that we want follows just by taking the square root of the both sides. Note that it's legit to take the square root of sine squared here and actually get sine theta and not just like the absolute value of sine theta because we know that sine theta has got to be positive because theta is in between 0 and pi by assumption. So that's the end of our proof. Now it follows directly from this theorem 
that two non-zero vectors, a and b, are parallel if and only if a cross b is zero. Let's see why that's true. Let's suppose that a and b are parallel. Then the angle theta between them is either zero or pi, depending on whether they're pointing in the same direction or in opposite directions. But either way, sine of theta is zero, so the magnitude of a cross b, which is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times sine theta is equal to zero. And therefore, a cross b is the zero vector. By the way, that zero should have had an error on the top because it's a zero vector, not a zero number. Now let's go the other direction. Let's suppose that a cross b is the zero vector. Then the magnitude of a cross b, which is the same thing as the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times sine theta, has to be zero. The zero vector has a magnitude of zero. But since we assume that a and b are non-zero, the magnitude of a is not zero and the magnitude of b is not zero, so that means sine theta has to be zero. And that means that theta has to be zero or pi, since we're assuming it's an angle between zero and pi. And two vectors that have an angle of zero or pi must be parallel. Finally, let's use these geometric facts and formulas in this example. We have two vectors, vector a and vector b, whose magnitudes are given. We're also given an angle of 210 degrees between them. We want to find the magnitude of a cross b and decide if it's directed up out of the page or down into the page. Well, to figure out whether it's directed up or down, we can use the right-hand rule. So you can believe me that I'm putting my right hand here along A and curling my fingers towards B, and my thumb is pointing straight up out of the page. So I'm going to circle up out of the page, and I invite you to try it yourself. Now, to find the magnitude, I can use that formula we just derived. The magnitude of A cross B is the magnitude of A cross times the magnitude of B times sine of theta. But be careful here, theta is not going to be 210 degrees. It's going to be this smaller angle that's less than 180 degrees. So that would be an angle of 150 degrees here. So now I can finish the computation. 5 times 10 times sine of 150 degrees, which is 5 times 10 times 1 half, which is 25 is the magnitude. In this video, I gave a formula for A cross B in terms of components, and also a way to think about A cross B geometrically. A cross B is perpendicular to A and B, with its direction given by the right-hand rule. In addition, the magnitude of A cross B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. In fact, this geometric information completely determines the vector A cross B. We know its exact direction, and we know its exact magnitude. So we know exactly where it is from this information. So we really have two alternative and complete characteristics, characterizations of A cross B.